Now let's move on. If we've got any Star Wars fans out there, Brad, they're going to like this one because astronomers have found a rare planet that resembles the fictional planet in that movie franchise. What is it? Uh, Tatooine. So uh, Tatooine is made famous, as he said, in, in, in Luke Skywalker's home in Star Wars, uh, is a planet that is what we call a circumbinary planet, a planet that orbits two stars. So obviously we orbit one in our solar system, but most of the stars in the nighttime sky are two, sometimes three or four star systems. So if we're going to find planets, the likelihood is, uh, as we're seeing with Skywalker on the screen, is that you're going to have two stars that you're orbiting and you would have two suns that you would have not just one sunrise, but two and two sunsets accordingly. Uh, and so it's not a surprise that they exist. It's just in how many we keep finding and how kind of exciting it is the range that we get. Now, the planet is 65 times heavier than Earth. Uh, and it orbits about every 217 days. So very different than Earth than even Luke Skywalker's home, more of a, a gas planet or an ice giant as we see in the edge of our solar system, but definitely showing just the range of almost science fiction worlds that lie out there in our galaxy. Yeah, there you go. Star Wars was just ahead of its time. It just exactly. knew, didn't it? It just knew. <laughs> now, scientists, Brad, they've discovered that Saturn's moon has all the ingredients for life on its icy ocean. So I guess the question, is life there? Yeah, look, this is this is the billion dollar question at this point, because every time we start studying a different aspect of these moons, in this case, Enceladus, we discover this, as you said, so phosphorus. So there's six main ingredients that we need for life. We're obviously a carbon based life form. So most of the things in our body are carbon. But phosphorus is another important ingredient and the smallest ingredient. But looking at data from the uh, Cassini probe that studied uh, Saturn and its moons, like Enceladus up close, they found in the data phosphorus present. So that in these geysers shooting off of the moon, as you just saw, they saw not just water coming out of it, but phosphorus. So everything that we keep looking for and finding appears to be underneath this ice and icy crust uh, of this moon. So. Oh, man, it's it's closer and closer every day that we're going to get that answer. And one day we finally will. I can't wait for the day that you and I have that discussion. <laughs> every week we get closer, but one day we will have that chat, That's Brad. Right. Now, this is exciting. Virgin Galactic has announced plans to launch its first commercial space flight this month. So what can we expect from that launch? That's right. So, you know, we saw back in 2021, they raced to do some of their test flights that including people, including famously Sir Richard Branson. And they've been getting ready for commercial operation. And as you said, now on the 27th of June, uh, they have a three-day window for their first commercial flight. This will actually take some Italian uh, astronauts up for some training and preparation, but they are now at the point where they will start monthly flights. So that on the 27th of June, they will have that first one. And then pretty much every three to four weeks thereafter, they will resume commercial operations because they actually have a lot of customers who've already paid for these flights. So they want to get going. They want to get moving. Uh, we saw Blue Origin uh, enter the commercial market quite rapidly. They have been on pause as they investigate uh, an accident with their rocket a number of months ago. So the commercial sector is still uh, there. It's still in demand. And what Virgin Galactic wants to do is to get these commercial flights going regularly so they can upgrade their next generation of planes to take more passengers and more regular, hoping for weekly flights coming in 2026. Oh, it's exciting. Uh, we're running out of time, but just quickly, can you tell us about the space plane itself? Yeah, so the way it works is there's kind of two parts. There's a larger part of the plane that actually takes the lifting up into kind of how a normal plane would fly the distance. And then you actually have these space planes. So the space plane is attached to this long winged air, uh, normal aircraft. The pl space plane drops and then uses an onboard rocket to then propel you up to about 80 to 85 kilometers. So you're reaching the point where you can actually start to see curvature, experience that floating around. But because you have a plane that takes you part of the way up, you don't need all of the energy a normal rocket would because the plane itself is doing some of that effort. So the engine on board the space plane can be a bit more smaller and more effective and therefore lighter, which means durable and hopefully doing it more often. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how these rehearsals go for the big event. So looking forward That's to right. seeing that. Brad, lovely to speak with you as always. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.